Thank you very much. Mr. Carter, you were recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity. And thank all of you for being here. I appreciate it very much. Do we want to pause? Thank you very much. We, you heard me already in my opening remarks say we have a climate emergency. So will you thank you very much for participating in, in this great democratic process. Can we proceed to get to the solutions? But thank you very much. Mr. Carter, you're recognized for, thank you. Mr. Carter, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Mr. Carter, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And again, thank all of you for being here. I, I want to ask you something um, that, uh, that I continue to remind my colleagues of. Do you know what the number one forestry state in the nation is? Ms. Yes, Peter. sir. We grow trees in the south like people grow corn in the, in the Midwest. Absolutely. We are blessed in, in the state of Georgia. We have the number one commercially available timberland, number one in annual timber harvest volume, number one in the exporter of full paper and paperboard mill products, number one exporter of wood fuel, and the number one exporter of wood pellets. And I say that to tell you that in the first congressional district, we've got some of the most competitive timberland in the in the nation and, and I'm very proud of that and I'm very proud of, of the resiliency that is offered through our sustainable forest and I want to point that out because Mr. Fugate would you agree that working forests can help to to bolster the resiliency of local landscapes both through reducing soil erosion and improving water quality as as well as a number of other things Yes, sir. In the South, we grow to silver culture. It's not a natural process. It grows trees for our, uh, production. However, they're not as resilient as we would like. The timber industry in the Florida Panhandle, and what we call the 850, has been devastated and will take decades to recover. Southwest Georgia saw the same thing. During extreme droughts, all of that timber becomes major wildfire areas. And as we continue to see our communities build into the interface, we have developed wildfire risk on the East Coast that may not be as grave as the West Coast, but is certainly changing the dynamics of that area. But that crop and that ability to plant trees obviously does a lot to put land that may not otherwise be usable into productive use, absorb carbon, and help build resilient economies. But it is not totally resilient to the impacts of climate. Absolutely, and I understand that, but it, that brings me to a point that I, I want to bring up. I've got some legislation. It's H.R. 1444, the Forest Recovery Act. Currently, under current law, if a working forest is struck by catastrophic loss, as you point out, often happens, hurricanes, wildfires, whatever it may be, 70% of timber farmers must simply eat the cost of that. What my bill does is to say that if they are to repurpose their land, that they could get a tax deduction for that. And that this would help us. The key there is repurposing it. What we don't want to see happen is for them to lose land or to turn it to some other use. We want to see them continue to have it to be forest land. And that's what my bill does and what it encourages because resiliency is extremely important and our forests are extremely important in that as well. Let me move on to um, talk about community resiliency because it's important today to understand I also have the honor and privilege of representing the entire coast of Georgia, including 110 miles of pristine coastline. And our coast has been hit by these natural disasters that you, that you mentioned. Three years in a row we had hurricanes, and this year we just barely missed one with Dorian, but we did miss it. But we still, this is something that impacts us very much. Mr. Fugate, how urgent do you believe it is for, for it, that, our, that we bolster our communities and make them more resilient to, re, to withstand these types of weather events? I think we can't talk about it anymore. We need to do it. My mom is from Scriven. I used to go down. Uh, Your mom Jekyll. is from Scriven? Yeah, we used to go down to Jekyll Island. That's, you know, I grew up on that part of the world. And what we know both across all of the Gulf Coast areas and the Atlantic Coast is we built communities for the past. And when people talk about resiliency, we don't have a good measure. So i like to introduce a measure because I think this would go right in line with what you're looking at. We need to start looking at the resiliency of the tax base of these communities. Because we're talking about infrastructure and other things, but what it ultimately comes down to and what Moody's and others are concerned about is what is the financial risk that communities have and what are they doing to offset that risk? And this goes back to where and how we build means that tax base will be there after disaster. We're seeing in the 850 panhandle Right now, 
Jackson County, Mariana, and other places, that their property values have decreased and are not coming back. We saw this in Hurricane Andrew in Homestead City when the Air Force Base closed. We're seeing this in Paradise from the wildfires in California. Those communities don't have a tax base. And as the chair will tell you, when you're a local official and your tax base is decreasing at the same time demand for services are increasing, you go into a death spiral and you can't recover. So I think we need to talk about resiliency of tax base and use that as the first nationwide measure of where our vulnerabilities are and where we need to be investing to ensure that communities have resilient tax bases. That's a great point, and, and probably the most important point there is just how we should be working with local communities as well, and that's extremely important. Madam Chair, I'm out of time, but thank you very much, and I yield back. Thank you.